Thank you. First of all, let me thank on behalf of uh, myself and Israel uh, for this opportunity uh, to present to present to the platform the um, project that we implemented uh, about two years ago and the results and the lessons that we learned from this project. Um, we this project is uh, it was funded by the FAO Flexible Multi Partner Mechanism. Uh, it was uh, targeting and the objective was to achieve. To facilitate to help with improving food security and nutrition in Eastern uh, and Southern Africa. And if we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, we will, uh, the presentation today, which will be delivered by uh, both Israt uh, and myself, and we will be taking, uh, we will be uh, taking turns. Uh, it will have four main. Uh, Parts. Uh, we will discuss a little bit the context and the objectives of the project. Uh, I will present part of the project outputs. Israel then will go on uh, with uh, the rest of the project outputs at the national level and the lessons that we learned. Learn. And then I will come up again with the future directions and what is our work on trade in FAO, in particular in Africa. So, if I may I'll, uh, begin. Uh, the, let's see a little bit the context and why uh, here in FAO we decided to work uh, in Eastern and Southern Africa, uh, in particular uh, on trade and food security. Uh, as we know, and probably people uh, in the platform know better than us, uh, agriculture is a very important sector in uh, LDCs uh, in Africa. It accounts for 27% of uh, income and 60% of employ employment. So. Um, for us in FAO, uh, we, we see that the way to improve the agricultural productivity in the countries, uh, actually, sorry, improving agricultural productivity in the countries is a key element to economic growth of uh, the African LDCs. But how can agricultural productivity be improved? On one hand, uh, we have to improve productive capacities, uh, agricultural productive capacities, which usually being done in countries through agricultural policy instruments. Uh, at the, but at the same time, because trade is, becomes more and more important all over the world, including LDCs, and in particular in developing countries and LDCs, uh, in order to, to, increase, to improve productive capacity, you have to have better, uh, more trade, if I could say, in quotes, better market access. And this is the part that is affected by the trade policy instruments. As such, to, to, to contribute to economic growth through agricultural productivity, you need, we need to be sure, uh, countries need to be sure that agricultural policies and trade policies, they're mutually reinforcing. And uh, in particular in LDCs where the resources, the public resources are scarce and there are not really a lot of funds available. However, while this is what it should be happening, what we have seen is that uh, there are many policies of policy incoherence. For example, you might have an agricultural policy that support, supports market price support, basically the objective being to have higher prices for the producers and the consumers will have to pay for these high prices. While at the same time, you see that on the trade side, you see that there are export restrictions with the objective being to reduce uh, prices. So these are two conflictual uh, objectives of two policy measures, and uh, this is something that it has to be addressed. At the same time, there are other examples that, for instance, the uh, trade, agricultural policy, agricultural ministry uh, prior, prior, prioritizes uh, different value chains than the ones that the trade uh, ministry or the trade policy strategy uh, puts priority on. And so uh, these are things that uh, we have seen uh, in our uh, work in the past. And if we can move to the next slide, um, we thought uh, we ho we held uh, even it was even before my time in FAO uh, when a workshop was held in uh, Harare uh, in uh, 2015. Uh, when there was a regional work workshop for Eastern and Southern Africa with the participation of uh, government officials from ministries of agriculture and trade from the countries, but also the regional economic communities, of course, the FAO country offices. It was a very big workshop that discussed exactly this and the, the policy incoherence between trade and agriculture. And we saw at the time that there is a, a very big, a strong interest from the countries in this discussion. 
uh, that we saw at the time that the focus is mostly on policy making processes, on how these agricultural and trade policies are being done, are being designed. And uh, we received requests from several countries, actually, to go there and to implement projects that, we will, that will support the uh, harmonization or the alignment of agricultural and trade policy making processes. And even at the time we started that work before this FMM project was implemented uh, in Mozambique and Swaziland. Uh, uh, and we also um, we included one whole chapter on governance of agriculture and trade planning processes in one of the FAO flagship publications. The, we call it SOCO, it's the State of Agricultural Commodity Markets. It was one of the five FAO flagship publications. And we had a whole chapter on governance and agricultural planning processes with recommendations of what could be uh, the best for countries to do. So, with this background and with this context, uh, we, we um, had the funds through this uh, flexible uh, uh, multi partner uh, mechanism in FAO. Uh, we had some funds and limited funds, of course, and limited time to try to. to to do what the countries basically asked us to do, to go and to try to have a process through which we will improve the capacities and uh, we will bring, we will have an impact uh, which is uh, more inclusive and efficient agricultural development and food system. Um, so, what it, it support in order to to enhance the level uh, of intra-regional trade? This is very much in line with one of the FAO's uh, strategic uh, objectives. Um, and my colleague Natalia, who's, who works for this uh, uh, part of FAO, for this program in FAO, the Food Systems Program, uh, so how we, we call it SP4, Strategic Program 4, uh, it was under the leadership of the Strategic Program on Food Systems that this project was implemented. and. Uh, we had two regional components, two sorry, two components, one regional and one national. The objective was to, uh, to improve capacities and at the regional level, uh, we, we tried to, we had an outcome which is, which was trying, we were trying to improve capacities of policy makers in Eastern and Southern Africa countries to design and implement evidence-based agricultural and trade policies. Uh, we said before that the context is that Okay. Uh, we said before that uh, the context we, we, that we have in uh, Eastern Southern Africa LDCs is that we need to have more efficient access to markets. And uh, in this regard, but the countries, they need to have evidence so that these policies that can be uh, uh, designed and implemented. And of course, the administrations in the country, the officials in the country, they have to have in the countries, they have to have the capacities to do that. Uh, the policy makers. So, uh, what we did is through at the regional level, and we'll get more into detail a little bit later. And uh, we uh, deliver, we had the facilita uh, facilitated delivery of two e learning courses on agricultural trade in Eastern and Southern Africa, and I will get more, uh, in more a little bit more details later. But also because, as we usually say among ourselves, we, we, you don't trade with yourself. Uh, the second output was to uh, start and to try to set up to establish a regional network, network of trade policy experts in the in the subregion. At the same time, the project had a national component. The, the, the outcome and the objective of this national component was basically to have uh, to enhance the cross-sectoral trade and agricultural coordination in the design and implementation of agricultural trade policies, strategies, and agreements at the country level. How we try to do that? We, we Through this project, and Israel will give a little bit more details on that uh, in a few minutes. Through this project, we focus in three priority countries for uh, FAO, for this strategic program four, uh, which were Mozambique, uh, Tanzania, and Zambia. And after doing uh, some a diagnostic assessment of policy coherence of where we stand on policy making processes. Uh, we, the, the idea was to develop, uh, to jointly through a consultative process in the country, even a consultative process was also this diagnostic assessment. It was done with a 
participation and actually had the ownership of the countries uh, to develop jointly prioritized projects and programs. Israel will give a little bit, a uh, few more details later on that. And we can move now to the next slide where I will try to present a little bit uh, the regional component of, the, of this uh, project very, very quickly so that uh, we will have time for some uh, discussion at the end. So what we did, as I said before, we here in FAO would have developed uh, global, two global courses that uh, deal with agricultural trade. One on uh, trade, food security and nutrition, and the other one on agriculture in the national trade agreement. Uh, the first one basically was developed because uh, there is a lot of attention that is, uh, that is being given to the relationship between trade and food security. And uh, what we tried to do in this course was to address these linkages, which are very often very complex. And uh, basically, they are the subject to a lot of debates, both at the national, but also at the global level. And we want to, through this course, we wanted to, uh, to ensure that the expansion of trade works for and not against uh, the eradication of hunger and food uh, insecurity. The second course, which is Agriculture in the National Trade Agreement, uh, it focuses basically on the rules that govern and regulate international trade, uh, because this is, what's this is what uh, these rules are being decided and agreed on at the glo through global regional uh, agreements, trade agreements, and this uh, agreements, these rules, they define the policy space within uh, which, uh, which is available for agriculture and trade uh, policies in the countries. So we thought that through these two courses, we will try, we will be in a position to facilitate or to increase the capacity of the policymakers in Eastern, uh, countries in Eastern and South Africa. But these are the global courses that we have developed. In order to, to, to have these courses being uh, better tailored for Eastern and Southern Africa, we adjusted the content. We <coughs> also uh, in, um, added content to these uh, courses in collaboration with TRAPCA, the Trade Policy Training Center uh, in Africa, which is uh, a training center based in Arusa in Tanzania, who was our partner in this, uh, in this effort. Uh, and uh, also, with, we did delivered these courses through the UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research platform. Uh, these courses were facilitated, so uh, there was a call for uh, participants that wanted to, to have this course. Uh, there was a selection process. Uh, we delivered these courses to 60 to 60 to 70 participants each. And of, of course, when I say that it was facilitated, we had questions. There was a weekly discussion where us and also Trapka College colleagues acting as the mentors or the topics that were being discussed. There was uh, testing so that the participants could get through UNITAR uh, uh, certificate of achievement. And um, then there was uh, also, and this is one of the reasons that we partnered with UNITAR, there was an impact study that was done uh, almost one year, one year and a half after the, the end of the, of the second course by UNITAR. Uh, the study was done by UNITAR and we got very, very um, encouraging uh, results. Uh, you can see some of them that we have got very high ratings. And actually the success of this pro effort and of this process is being uh, showcased by the fact that we have um, uh, more high interest from countries and using FA resources, we have continued this process, we have ex expanded this process to Central and Western Francophone Africa, uh, and we have more reruns of, this, uh, of these courses in English in Eastern and Southern Africa. If we can move to the next slide, please, then I move to the second output of the regional uh, component of the, of the FMM project, which was the creation of uh, Agricultural Trade Policy Practitioners Network, the ATPPN, as we call it. Uh, this was also done with the, in collaboration with TRAPCA, our regional uh, partner, and the objective was to facilitate um, the cross-sectoral and cross country collaboration on policy, on emerging policy issues. Uh, we wanted to bring together policymakers mostly, but also uh, 
people from uh, uh, other stakeholders in the country, like, uh, for instance, uh, and not only the countries, but also regions, because we had some uh, people that they are from regional economic communities to bring them together and to give them the opportunity to discuss trade issues and to exchange on trade issues because we think that this is the best way for them to find solutions on emerging uh, issues. Uh, so the participants in this network, as you can see, they include minister, people from the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministries of Agriculture, from Trade, Finance, Planning, uh, Boards, Commercial uh, uh, chamber, Chambers uh, of, uh, in uh, countries. Uh, they, this was the result of the uh, this network was the result of this FMM project, so it's mostly in uh, Eastern and Southern Africa, English-speaking countries. Most of the countries in Eastern and Southern Africa, they are represented. Uh, and we tried little by little, and in collaboration with TRAPCA, we continue with more resources dedicated by FAO into this effort. Uh, we tried little, little by little to have the, the meeting networks uh, step by step and not with many very big steps so that we try to somehow set well what we are doing before doing the next step. And uh, we had already three uh, network meetings. The third one was held uh, one month and a half ago in Tanzania uh, with, uh, in Arusa where the Trapka is uh, based. And actually, the, what shows also the continuing effort for building capacities is the fact that some of the members of this network, they, they are now master students with TRAPCA. Um, the result of this, what we want to achieve with that is, as I said, to bring people together to discuss emerging and important issues. And we have this network, we want the involvement and the participation of the network members on the outputs, actually, of this network. So we want them, and this is something that we are now building on little by little, to have them being part of the specific uh, deliverables, like, for instance, an annual publication that we want to have where we want the, the network members to express their opinion or their country's opinion. Uh, we want to have um, uh, the newsletters that this is Trapka that we'll have to uh, that is preparing in collaboration with the FAO, some policy briefs. For instance, uh, we had a policy brief on the, the continental free trade area. Uh, so we are trying to have these products that will allow discussion between the members, but also to have the participation of the members. And actually, all this effort is being done because FAO, as you know very well, is present in many, many countries, but also we have a regional office in Africa. This effort for the establishment, uh, which is for Africa, which is in uh, Accra, in Ghana, uh, this effort for the establishment of this uh, network of trade practitioners, it is done in collaboration with our regional office. And actually, now it is, uh, from now on, it will be led by our regional office in, uh, in Ghana, uh, because we, had, we have held discussions also with the African Union Commission, and uh, it seems that there is a strong interest on their side to, to kind of institutionalize under the AUC, this effort that we have done so far. So our, our regional office in Africa will lead this effort from now on with the technical support from, from us here in the headquarters, uh, with the final objective being to have um, the AUC basically uh, as an overarching uh, platform for this uh, network. Um, I will hand it over now to Isra, who will present the national outputs, uh, the national related outputs of the of the project. Thank you, George. Uh, uh, so going back to the context that George uh, very nicely explained, that in fact the issues are first of all between countries, and that's why one of the uh, one of the outputs was regional in nature. But many of the issues actually stem from coordination and collaboration issues within the countries. So we wanted to have a national component that dealt into the policy making processes in some more depth. Uh, and for this, uh, we had a consultative process established in each of the three countries in which we worked. Uh, so that's uh, Zambia, Mozambique, and Tanzania. Uh, we had the creation of what we called at the time the country team. So we had uh, uh, stakeholders or uh, policy uh, representatives from different departments within Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of Trade. Um, and really the goal of this uh, effort, at least the first output, was 
first of all, to assess the gaps and the synergies between the agriculture and trade policies in the countries, um, and also to examine a little bit the, the policy making processes, exactly how the institutional structure uh, is, is, is operating in the countries, uh, which leads to the design and implementation of, uh, of the sectoral policies. And how we did that was uh, through, first of all, a desk review of the reference policy documents. So examining within agriculture, what are the main policy documents that are um, that are defining uh, the priorities in the uh, in the country? On the trade side, the same thing. What are the main major policy documents that are de defining it? Um, and then we had a lot of bilateral consultations with the ministries, but also with uh, other stakeholders that were um, actually suggested to us uh, by the ministries and and by other um, stakeholders. Uh, Within the country to try to identify the, the, the mechanisms that are in place. So whether there are any institutional cross-sectoral mechanisms in place uh, that, that link the ministries of agriculture and trade uh, and how those work, uh, what are the lessons uh, from past or existing mechanisms in terms of uh, their effectiveness. And really we had two types of findings that, that emerged. Um, and of course, within the countries, we, you know, you have a lot of detailed kind of uh, feedback that you get. But if we can synthesize uh, at a high level, uh, you know, comparing across the three countries, uh, there were really two major types of findings that emerged. One was on uh, the agriculture and trade policy agendas, uh, as we call them. So really, what is the institutional architecture in place for agriculture and trade? What are the major policy documents? How do they inform the, the priorities of the country, uh, and then uh, uh, conclusions that emerge from the stated priorities in these documents. Um, and the second type of finding that we had was in terms of the institutional mechanism. So how are the policies being formulated and so on. So on this first slide, what I have here is the, uh, is, uh, the, the findings on the agendas themselves. So what we found was that in agriculture, so first of all, before we get into the sectoral agendas, um, in each of these countries, like in most countries, there is a, a sort of a high level national vision, national policy vision, uh, national development strategy, sometimes it's called. It's a long term vision that defines the broad uh, country objectives, uh, the broad country priorities uh, across all sectors. So most policies, agriculture, trade, industry, they're all, they tend to be aligned to this national uh, vision or strategy. Uh, however, in the case of agriculture, as many of the, the participants in this platform would be uh, intimately familiar with this, um, in agriculture in Africa, uh, there is a pan-African uh, framework, which is CADAP, which also uh, is, um, let's say, central. It's a central feature of agricultural policy making in at least the countries in which we worked. So the national agricultural policy and the national agricultural investment plan was not only aligned to the national the overarching vision, but it was also aligned to the CADAP uh, framework. Um, and CADAP, of course, has uh, uh, different pillars. And trade is uh, a prominent feature of the of the CADAP framework. It's within pillar two on markets and trade. It serves as the entry point for the identification of agricultural trade issues. Now, when we got into the priorities, when we tried to assess what are the types of issues that are identified by these agricultural, uh, by by let's say the national agricultural investment plans on trade, we found that there, there were some limitations uh, in the sense that they would only go so far as um, identifying priority commodities, but not getting into the specific issues, the specific interventions that are needed to address those, uh, the, the, the priorities. So for instance, you might have um, a priority on agricultural uh, commercialization in general, or a specific you know, a value addition for a specific commodity, but it doesn't get into exactly what the issues are that are preventing that commercialization or value addition. There's no specific um, interventions on, for instance, standards or market access constraints or trade facilitation. So there we found it was a little bit um, uh, broad in terms of the, uh, the kind of aspiration uh, that, that was a part of the knives. On the trade side, uh, which in stark contrast to agriculture, uh, we found that there is no currently no pan-African policy framework that guides trade policy making in the different countries. So what you find is that in each individual country, um, trade policy making tends to be a bit more fragmented. You have a uh, national export strategy, you'll have a national industrial policy and trade policy, and then you might even have a, a commodity specific strategy, but um, there's no kind of uh, 
a clear um, commonality across the countries that uh, that emerged. And maybe this will change with the, the free trade area, the continental free trade area. Um, but at the moment, or at least when the study was done, uh, this came out as, as a strong sort of um, uh, finding. Um, what we did find was that, uh, now some of you might be familiar with the Enhanced Integrated Framework, which is a, a framework that's based out of the WTO in Geneva. Um, and it has a, a mechanism in all LDCs to support what they call the Diagnostic Trade Integration Study. So this was one uh, common, uh, let's say, mechanism that we found across all the LDCs, including, of course, the African LDCs in which we were working, that we, we thought we could examine as obviously not exactly the, uh, the equivalent of CADAP, but at least a common mechanism that we could establish, or uh, that we could examine further. And what we found there was that uh, even though every five years or so there, there are a lot of resources dedicated to the preparation of the, uh, the Diagnostic Trade Integration Study or its updates, um, what we find is that um, it's, not, uh, it, it's not a central feature of trade policy making in at least the countries where we examined. It certainly is something that is undertaken by ministries of trade, but it doesn't necessarily feed into the national trade policy or the national export strategy and so on. And uh, even though the DTIS, in comparison to the, the, the NIAPS, uh, even though they do articulate trade-related constraints uh, by commodity sometime um, in more depth than, let's say, the NIAPS, uh, the commodities themselves don't really align with the NIAPS. So the NIAPS might be uh, identifying uh, more, we, what we tend to find is more food uh, products um, for commercialization, for value addition, whereas the trade, the DTIS tends to prioritize uh, more sort of for kind of export commodities or, or um, cash crops or, or things like that. So uh, there wasn't much of an alignment between them. So that's something that really came out that the, the, the key guiding frameworks in the two ministries are different. Uh, there is not uh, a common element of trade uh, policy making across the countries and that the priorities themselves between agriculture and trade tend to be quite different, even in terms of the commodities that are um, that are prioritized. And if we can move on to the next slide. Um, so here I we tried to summarize kind of the, the big takeaways in terms of policy formulation and implementation, uh, the processes underlying this. And we found that um, although uh, the structure for uh, cross-sectoral coordination exists. You have, for instance, dedicated committees that are constituted in each of these countries. Um, the extent to which they're operational, they're effective or sustainable even, uh, was something that we found uh, was somewhat of a challenge. So, for instance, you have agriculture sector working groups uh, that have many uh, technical subgroups that are part of them. However, for each of the different countries, uh, sometimes they're constituted during the NIAP formulation, but then they don't continue. Um, sometimes they they do continue, but the issue is actually the, uh, in actual fact, there, there seems to be limited engagement between technical level officials from the different ministries. So um, there, they, there might be some participation, but uh, really at the technical level, those responsible for actual policy implementation uh, are not uh, participating uh, in an active way. Um, and this might be uh, for, for various reasons in each of the countries. Maybe the, 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 the working group, the sector working group is not directly aligned to sort of the outputs of that ministry. So there's no incentive, for instance, for, for active participation. Uh, but also uh, quite crucially, what we found is that there are limited links between uh, the actual policy formulation process with the, the actual program design and implementation, with uh, national budgeting and, and program implementation. So even though you have a lot of resources that are dedicated to the, the formulation of NIPES, they don't necessarily reflect, for instance, the, uh, in the agriculture budgets of most of these countries. Uh, at least when we did the study, we found that uh, the agriculture budgets, they tend to be dominated by a small set of um, uh, of, of priorities, uh, typically, you know, input subsidies or uh, market price support mechanisms, uh, public stock holding and so on, um, and really very limited resources for um, the types of priorities, trade related priorities that are in the NIAP, uh, including value addition, commercialization and so on. Um, on the other hand, trade budgets tend to be uh, smaller in, in general, uh, if we can make that generalization. Uh, they tend to be uh, supported largely by, by donor resources. Um, and but they also do not reflect, uh, you know, using DTIS as an example. But many of the 
the priorities that are identified in the DTIS don't necessarily make it uh, to the trade uh, trade projects that are actually implemented on the ground. So one thing that we tried to do with the very limited resources that, and time that we had uh, on this project was we tried to identify, again, through a very consultative process, um, common priorities between agriculture and trade uh, for which we could design, uh, for which we could support the design of uh, projects um, in each of the different countries. Uh, so very briefly, I'll, I'll present what we did in each of the three. Um, so we have, for instance, Mozambique, um, the focus was very much on uh, right away from all our consultations, there was a clear interest uh, and a gap in market information systems uh, and, uh, and agricultural uh, data. So this is actually, we, we did this through, um, this was price data and sub-national marketing data that was, uh, that was in, of interest. Uh, this required, in, for instance, in the development of the proposal, we, we had a lot of sub-national consultations and sub-national um, uh, discussions to try to identify exactly where the gaps were and, uh, and what needed to be put in place. So uh, the, the proposal was eventually, uh, it, it informed the ongoing, at the time there was a NIAB update that was being done. So it informed that process, but we also managed to get uh, more donors being part of this discussion uh, in order to, to move this forward. Uh, in Zambia, uh, as opposed to Mozambique, uh, the, the interest was more diverse. There was an interest on three areas, uh, really. One was very similar to Mozambique where they, they wanted um, more uh, work to be done on data and market information systems. And in particular, in, Zamb uh, in Zambia at the time, they were really interested in improving the, the ministry's own um, uh, data on food stocks, but also sub-national marketing and, and trade information. Um, the second area where they identified already three value chains where they wanted to improve uh, farm to market linkages. So improving what they called uh, productive alliances and selected value chains. So these were maize, soybean, and cassava. And finally, they had an interest in enhancing small-scale trade facilitation, uh, very much in line with the Kumesa uh, simplified trade regime, which they wanted to improve implementation of in Zambia. Um, and in this case, in Zambia, there was an ongoing, um, there was a, a project, uh, to, it's called CASU, the Conservation Agriculture Scale-Up Project, uh, implemented by the EU, which was uh, ending at the time. And uh, the new project was being um, formulated. So the, the proposals or the, the this concrete ideas that came out of this project were used to inform that, uh, that project update. Um, and finally, in Tanzania, uh, there was a clear interest uh, in the policy process itself. So they found through the study that, in fact, the structures for cross-country collaboration, cross-sectoral collaboration, sorry, uh, were uh, quite weak, and they wanted to promote to to implement uh, uh, improvements to that through uh, the setup of national coordination teams and thematic working groups and so on. Uh, and this is also something that I believe was taken up by um, uh, in the in the NIAP uh, update process. Uh, and finally, uh, we don't present this today because, uh, uh, but in fact, we actually also extended this uh, approach. Uh, what I've just described over the last two slides. Uh, we were requested to also um, to do this approach in Rwanda uh, as because there was another FMM project ongoing on value chains in the, in, the, uh, in Africa at the, in, at the time. And in Rwanda, for part of it, they wanted uh, to also do this kind of assessment of policy coherence. Uh, we don't present the results of that because it's a little bit different from uh, overall, the project was a little bit different from what we're doing here. But just to mention that uh, it was also done there. Uh, and if we can move on to the next slide. Um, so from all of this, from both the country and the regional level activities, uh, we tried to draw the lessons that sort of we can take away uh, based again on the limited resources and time that we were able to spend uh, in the delivery of these activities. Uh, we, I should mention uh, actually at the outset that we uh, worked for part of these activities with uh, ECDPM, this is a European Center for Development Policy Management, and with them we prepared a synthesis report. Um, and if I can, uh, maybe we'll just summarize three sort of major uh, takeaways that we can we can share uh, from this project. The first is that uh, it's important; it would be important going forward to make policy priorities in each of the countries 
uh, as policies are developed, to make them more concrete, to make them more specific, um, because often what tends to happen is when development partners and donors try to support new projects, um, you start kind of uh, from ground zero. You start by doing more diagnostic assessments, more um, uh, more information is generated, but then there's not enough follow up. And I think the, the or we thought that the policy priorities themselves can be much more concrete, especially in the NIABs on trade related issues or market related issues. And one way in which to do this to make them more concrete is to promote uh, more inclusive consultations with local government officials and with the private sector and policy formulation. This is something that actually the our consultations in the countries, um, several uh, in, in each of the countries, we heard this uh, several times that often the, the consultations at the local levels are, are, are somewhat weak uh, and, and don't get reflected uh, uh, adequately in the policy priorities. And then the second uh, major takeaway is, you know, how to better channel uh, the, the limited resources that do exist in countries. Um, and one thing that really came away from this project was that um, the role and influence of these uh, high level uh, policy documents or investment plans can be improved. So in the case of CADAP, uh, in a sense, Africa has made uh, excellent progress in having uh, even a, a pan-African uh, policy framework, which supports the design of agricultural policies in each of these countries. And a lot of resources are spent in the design of the, uh, the national agricultural investment plans. However, as we saw with, uh, with the budget alignment, that often the NIAPs um, are not actually, maybe the, the role and influence of the NIAPs in, in actual annual planning and budgeting is, is, uh, is somewhat weak and can be strengthened in order to make sure that the resources that are spent in identifying priorities actually lead to uh, the implementation of those priorities. And in the case of trade policy frameworks, of course, as we mentioned before, there is no equivalent of CADAP in the CFTA. Uh, and maybe uh, in the meantime, we, we focused on the DTIS, but again, any resources that are spent in, in prioritization, uh, somehow they, they can be improved, the, the, their links with annual uh, planning and budgeting can be improved. Uh, and of course, this leads to the next point, which is uh, there's a, a need to support policy implementation. So for instance, through maintaining cross-sectoral coordination, not just in, in the policy formulation phase, phase but also uh, maintaining uh, links between technical level officials in the design and, and implementation of joint programs. Um, and related to, to both of these issues is improving coordination among donors and development partners. Of course, <laughs> this, this group uh, knows that very well. And, and this, uh, this platform is, of course, uh, one uh, step in that direction, but also at the country level, um, trying to focus between common, uh, focusing on common priorities between agriculture and trade uh, can perhaps support um, more joint uh, joint efforts and uh, the use of uh, scarce public resources more efficiently. And then I will take it over for, uh, for the last slide, which are the future directions of our work on trade here in FAO. On the basis of these experiences that is just uh, outlined of the lessons that we learned. Basically, what we saw is that there are some um, common priorities between agriculture and trade that uh, have been emerged. Uh, on one, first of all, we have uh, there is this thing, the, the, the theme of strengthening farm to market segment of priority value chains. Um, if there are these priority value chains, it, it was clear that there is a, an interest to, to strengthen uh, the whole value chain from, from the beginning to the end, actually. And in this regard, um, what I, what I will say about each one of these three themes is what the FAO is trying to do and what, uh, where we want to get and what type of project proposals we have prepared uh, to, to get into these themes that have been identified. On, uh, on the value chain work, we, have, uh, we are working and we have developed a project proposal for the establishment for setting up uh, the dairy platform in East Africa with the participation of specific countries uh, in the, in the sub-region. Uh, we want to, basically this comes also as a priority from uh, work that has been done. Um, FAO was involved in the preparation of the COMESA uh, Regional Agricultural Investment Plan, and this is a pri a pri one of the priorities that have been identified in the COMESA right. So the idea is to, to bring all the relevant stakeholders, farmers organizations, cooperators, processors, traders, regional banks, regulators, all together 
to discuss, to, to help them identify the issues that they have to do with the dairy sector in, the, in Eastern Africa, and to help them find solutions. To, to establish its platform, uh, this dairy platform, as a platform that will manage to help all these stakeholders in addressing problems that they have uh, in this region for dairy products. And in order for this platform to be effective, it has to be sustainable and it has to continue beyond any project that will be implemented. In this regard, what we are trying to, to do through this proposal that we have developed is to, to have a blended financing, to, to have both to have public, private and development partner engagement uh, and resource mobilization so that uh, all of them that will be part of this effort to of, of this effort of bringing people together and addressing the issues all together. Uh, the second uh, ma major theme that comes out basically not only as a lesson from this work, but in general it comes out in Africa, it is the application, it's it has to do with trade facilitation and in particular uh, with the sanitary and phytosanitary measures. Uh, as FAO, basically because we are a food and agriculture organization, SPS is the main entry point for us when we discuss trade facilitation instruments. And uh, actually, uh, I don't know if you're aware, probably you're very well aware of the fact that there is a trade facilitation agreement of the WTO, which tries to address uh, uh, such issues with regard to, to, to trade facilitation. Uh, but uh, even if red tape, basically, uh, or at the customs level, however, um, the trade facilitation agreement does not get into SPS. And it is very often uh, observed that while uh, the customs level, uh, you can uh, address these issues that delays, that they have delays, they create delays at the borders, that, that they really make trade even more difficult. Uh, you have bottlenecks that they relate to SPS. So this is something that we see and we get a lot as an, uh, an inquiry on how NFAO work on that. So we are, have developed a project of proposal, basically, which will be a South-South exchange, lessons learned. We have here as an example, ASEAN, uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council, but also uh, regional efforts at the, in Latin America or in other parts of the world, but all, uh, mostly South-South exchange, because this could be closer to what the needs in the in African continent are. But all of these lessons, they can be adapted and uh, so that they can, uh, so solutions can be implemented in Africa uh, X. But also uh, this uh, will have to, to, to go down and this could go down actually to technical support that could, should be provided at the country level or, or even at selected border crossings in a way that it will facilitate uh, and will manage to address bottlenecks faced by the private sector that, uh, that has, to be our main target, uh, because these are the actual uh, trade operators. And of course, uh, in, the, in Africa, what we always see as well, and this was clear in the FMM project, clear in the FMM project, was the need for market information systems, uh, for data and for policy analysis. Uh, in this regard, it's not a project proposal that we have developed, but what we're trying to do is to build kind of, a, of an umbrella. What we're designing is kind of an umbrella where we want to develop uh, and we're getting into this a uh, little by little, uh, practical training mod modules uh, on the development and deployment of market information systems, trade data analysis and policy analysis, among other things. Uh, but this it cannot be by itself because having training models at the end, at the end it doesn't say anything. Um, we want to have, we are also want to develop a rapid assessment tool that will comprise both uh, data-based indicators, but also a consultative process in the countries. So this, this the combination of these two will allow uh, a better understanding of the different, of the gaps and the needs in countries. And then for the, using the manuals that uh, will be developed or are being developed to deliver adapted and targeted trainings to address these specific gaps that the rapid assessment tool will identify. With that, we will stop. Thank you very much. Uh, in the next slide, you can see a series of, of links where you can find information basically on most of the things that we presented. And uh, I hope that we didn't take a, uh, much longer than we should and we are ready to address any question or any, 
any comment uh, to receive any comment that you might have. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, uh, Georgios and Israt, for the presentation. I found it very interesting. Um, I'm really interested of um, what will follow on on the learnings you've had and the longevity of some of the programs you have. Um, I was thinking on the national level, the work you did in supporting the countries you worked with in supporting the design of projects and implementation of, and, and assessing their policies and, and coherence of trade and agriculture policies was really interesting. Is there any thoughts of continuing this sort of work with other countries or following up and seeing how the countries have implemented the learnings from the first assessment? We will both say something, I assume, uh, on uh, the e-learnings and how we're trying to build capacities through them. Really, we, we, as I said even during the presentation, we continue this effort. Um, we have these courses. These courses are global, but we have uh, adjusted them uh, to Eastern and Southern Africa. We have adjusted to uh, Central and Western flank of Africa, and actually even beyond Africa, we have adjusted them to the former Soviet uh, countries, where we also try to, to build capacities. A different, uh, there the issues are different, uh, the, the needs are different, so the courses are basically, uh, I would say that they're quite different from the ones that we have in Africa. So, uh, this effort continues with uh, FAO resources, with the limited resources that we have. We're trying to continue this effort because Actually, the feedback that we have received from the participants are extremely, extremely positive. Personally, I find I think that it's even more positive than I was expecting it to be uh, at the beginning. So, in this regard, we see that that effort of capacity building it works. Uh, the participants they say that they can really use the things that they learn uh, uh, into everyday their everyday job, and we're very happy with that. Uh, concerning the national uh, work and whether we will continue that ex exactly that type of work in uh, other countries, Israel can respond. But what I could say is that uh, exactly what I presented in my last slide, in the last slide, which was the future work, basically, and on the basis of the lessons that we learned from this FMM, we think that uh, we should uh, we should try and direct our uh, actions in the future towards this, these three main themes that came as lessons from uh, the FMM and other activities that we're doing in Africa uh, on trade. So, not uh, having the exact same approach in the countries, but keeping with uh, staying within the same theme of. Uh, policy coherence between trade and agriculture, basically to have to try to have these three entry points, if, if I would say, to this uh, debate. Is that if you... Uh, yes, exactly. I was going to say the same, but uh, going back to, so starting with the national, exactly, the, the, the issues we identified, I think, were quite common across the countries. And what's necessary or what's missing a little bit is the support to policy implementation. So I think uh, as development partners, what we can do is really to, to focus this effort on policy coherence on more concrete themes. So rather than focusing very broadly on what the issues of policy coherence or incoherence might be, to, to delve into specific thematic areas such as you know, value addition or value chain uh, development in specific commodities, on the other hand, on uh, SPS and, and trade facilitation, these are areas where there's a clear need for greater coherence and we could support that. And that's actually what we're trying to do through the, the future work. And in terms of e-learnings and the longevity of that, um, we I think this is also already um, a very low cost in a sense, um, you know, approach that I think is UN wide now. It's, it's, it's growing. Um, where it's not really in country sort of five week trainings, but a low cost approach to, to training that is also effective, hopefully, that uh, that generates interest. In fact, we've had a lot of participants um, suggesting the courses to their colleagues to take. Uh, and, and so this is a way for us to continue. And we hope to continue this uh, as long as there is demand for it uh, and to, to respond to whatever uh, country needs there might be. Thank you very much. That was very clear. 
Hi, yes, this is Manuel um, from the Secretariat for the Global Donor Platform. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, what do you two see as the main challenges or the main, the main obstacles to implement uh, projects that focus on common priorities between agriculture and trade that, uh, that, the AF, that you guys have proposed at the FAO? Well, thank you very much, Manuel. This is really very, very interesting and very big. Uh, what we, I will say, I will say a couple of things and then Mr. Tsi will uh, add if he wants. Um, from what we learned from all this work that we're doing, uh, implementing projects uh, on, uh, on this is, first of all, it is that the countries themselves, they have established some mechanisms to to bring agriculture and trade people together, policymakers together, they might have the committees, they might have the boards, they might have whatever they what whatever it would be needed for uh, for them to design and to um, to set up the nice the, the appropriate policies and coherent policies. Uh, but uh, uh, on the other hand, these mechanisms that they have, they don't work well. And so um, it is very difficult, actually, to uh, when you're discussing uh, policy coherence between trade and agriculture at the policy design level, an intervention is not difficult, but uh, it is it is getting difficult from the fact that these mechanisms are are in place, but they don't work well. And when you discuss policy coherence between agriculture and trade at the implementation level, then it gets difficult because exactly the mechanisms that are in place are not working. So you have non-working platforms at the countries that creates difficulties both at the policy design level when you're working or trying to work with the countries at the policy design level and also when you're trying to work with the countries at the policy implementation level. And over there, and this is a good opportunity that, uh, for, for this platform, what I would say is that uh, the role of donors and development partners is very important on that. In particular, when we get, and I put also FAO into this uh, picture, in particular, when we get into the policy implementation, uh, because at the end of the day, what we noticed is that priorities that might, even if we manage to have aligned priorities, between agriculture and trade at the country level, when when we get into the implementation, the development partners' priorities are getting in the middle. Uh, the funding might be targeting one or uh, against another priority. So at the end of the day, there is probably a lack of coordination between all the stakeholders at the country level. And by all the stakeholders, I mean uh, not only the ministries, and some of the ministries, they might not be part of this coordination, coordinating effort. But when I say all stakeholders, I mean the development uh, partners. Uh, I mean the NGOs that are uh, uh, being active in the in the country. So for us, this was one. This was a big issue that uh, we we saw when it comes to to this to, to working on, on policy coherence. The other issue, and this is something that uh, Isred alluded uh, into, was the fact of data and information. That in many cases, uh, there is no sufficient, sufficient data uh, to do the necessary analysis and to build the necessary evidence uh, for everything that, uh, so that you have the, the platform on which you can build these interventions that you wanna, uh, that you wanna do. And this is something actually in Africa, I assume that all of you, you might get into this problem uh, in the projects that you implement. Uh, that's why in Africa, there is this need for information system came up very, very strongly uh, in our efforts. It was not only the need for the policies to be designed, but data, is, uh, data are also needed for the intervention that is needed to bring policies together. Uh, the things that I could think of now. Probably you, with your experience, you could say many more things, but these are the things that could uh, just come into my head as we talk. Thank you so much.